Thanks, Armand. When new pilots are learning how to handle different wind conditions, it's common to learn what speed to fly in headwinds or tailwinds. Uh, today, we're going to talk about why we fly those speeds and the impact that it has on glide ratios. So we'll start by just giving a quick review of glide calculations in still air, and then we'll adjust for headwinds, tailwinds, and talk about winds on final approach. So as a quick note, the numbers you see in this presentation are based off of the performance numbers of an ASK21 at a higher wing loading to make some nice easy numbers. So in particular, we are looking at a min sink of 45 knots and a best L over D speed of 50 knots. So quick refresher, every glider has a best glide or L over D max, which is the furthest distance forward it can go for a unit of altitude lost. And this can be determined by looking at the polar curve published by the manufacturer. And from that curve, we can tell what airspeed to fly to achieve that L over D max, as well as what the minimum sink is for the glider. And if we look at the polar curve for a K21, the, the origin is up here somewhere. We can draw a tangent from the origin down to the curve. And if we project up to the x-axis where that uh, tangent point is, we can get the airspeed at which the L over D max is achieved. And if we look at the highest point of the curve, this is the speed at which we can sink the least, and therefore is our minimum sink speed. Once you know the performance of your glider, there's some quick cockpit math you can do when you realize that one nautical mile is about 6,000 feet. It's a nice round number. So you can think about number of nautical miles forward per thousand feet lost. And a six to one glider can travel one nautical mile and lose a thousand feet. Nice round math. Um, for a given glider, you wanna use about half the published L over D max uh, for safety reasons when doing glide calculations. And for this ground school, the, we're gonna assume the K21 has an 18 to one glide ratio. So that means it can travel three nautical miles, which is 18,000 feet forward and lose 1,000 feet. So pretty quick and easy math that for every three nautical miles you are away from the airport, you need an additional 1,000 feet of altitude. <clears throat> Another thing you can do when you know the performance of your glider is draw glide rings to say for a given altitude above arrival that I am away from the airport, where can I be? Or you can invert that and ask for a given distance away from my arrival point, how much altitude do I need to safely arrive there? And we've drawn that out here for a couple different boulder landmarks uh, and based on certain round distances away. So you can pause the video and go through the math here for our 18 to one ASK 21 and see the different altitudes that are required for a 7,000 foot arrival back at the Boulder Airport. So that's still air, but what do we do in a headwind? How do we adjust uh, the speed that we fly for a headwind? So the naive approach might be to just keep flying your L over D max airspeed. But if you take this to the extreme and imagine that you're fighting a headwind that is equivalent to that L over D max airspeed, the glider would go nowhere you would just slowly sink down to the ground. And surely we can do better. So the recommendation is to add half the headwind to that L over D max airspeed and fly that into a headwind. But why? So we're gonna talk about why and how that affects your glide ratio. So if you look at the polar curve for the K21, so this blue line is the polar curve. If we move our origin over to 20 knots, for example, for this 20 knot headwind can, example here, you wanna ask the question, what's the best, how do, what's the best uh, glide ratio I can achieve at what airspeed? And we do the same thing we do with no wind. If we draw a tangent down to the curve, we'll get a point, and if we project that up to the x-axis, we'll get an indicated airspeed that we should fly. And the way to think about that in terms of glide ratio now is if you have that indicated airspeed and you subtract the wind, 
then you will travel some distance over the ground for the sink that occurs at that airspeed. And so that ground speed over the airspeed is what your glide ratio is at that wind condition. So if you take that and do that for any given wind condition, you can calculate your best speed to fly. But we can't consult the curve mid-flight all the time, so we use the estimate of flying half the headwind in addition to best all over D. And if you look at lots of different wind conditions um, and lots of different gliders, it turns out that this estimate is accurate enough for its simplicity, especially given that we rarely know the exact wind and gusts cause far more error than plus or minus a couple knots on your airspeed. So if we take uh, this calculation for the glide ratio of wind and we apply that to a couple different wind conditions, you can look for your glider and see what would my glide ratio be in these different wind conditions. And then you can think ahead of time and adjust for what your safe L over D would be in those wind conditions so that you can do the math and uh, know ahead of time if you're fighting some wind condition what a glide ratio you can expect. And when you've plotted this out, there's a couple different ways you can look and think about this data. The first is you can just plot it on a graph to kind of help you understand how your L over D is going to be impacted by headwind. Or we can look at glide rings like we did before and ask, if I have a certain amount of altitude above my arrival, how far away can I be to safely arrive at my destination? And you can play with these numbers to see for your glider what impact wind has on your glide rings. And in general, um, it's going to make the glide rings and smush them together because if you look for here, for example, if we have a 15 knot uh, headwind from the east, for every thousand feet, we can travel much less distance. So it smushes those rings um, on that side of the glide ring. Or we can take that, those numbers and look at it from a distance perspective and say, if I'm so far away from my destination, how much altitude do I need? And you can look at the impact that the wind has on the altitude requirements at certain distances which is an interesting way to think about and kind of ahead of time plan for different expectations in wind conditions. So that was a look at headwinds, um, but now we're gonna look at what do we do in tailwinds. So the recommendation in a tailwind is to fly L over D max minus half the tailwind, um, but never slower than min sync because your performance will decrease after uh, slower than min sync. Um, and in general, L over D max and min sync are so close together that once you get to about a 10 knot tailwind, uh, you should just fly min sync. Um, and the concept here is you just hang in the air while the wind pushes you in the direction you want to go. So if we visualize this a little bit, um, you know, we've got, we're flying at some airspeed and the wind is just pushing us. So our glide ratio is our total distance over the ground, which is the wind plus our airspeed, over the sink rate for that airspeed. A pretty simple calculation there. And we can do the same thing we did before and walk through a couple different tailwind situations and plot out what our glide ratio is in that wind condition and what our safe glide ratio would be. And we can look at it from the glide ring perspective and ask if I have certain altitude above arrival, how far away from the airport can I be to get back safely? And we can also invert that and look at it for given distances away from the airport, how much altitude would I need to cover that distance? And you can play with this for different tailwind conditions and different distances that might make sense for your glider or location. And finally, we wanna talk about how to handle wind on final approach. So the recommendation when flying uh, final approach is to take your yellow triangle plus half the headwind plus all of the gust. And the reason we do that is because half the headwind will give us our best performance as we just talked about. So you'll get your best performance over the ground. And we add all of the gusts to make sure that we're flying a safe airspeed 
if the gust ends. So for example, if you're flying a glider with a 40 knot stall speed and you're flying yellow triangle 50 knots on final approach, but you're flying into a gust of 10 knots, your speed over the ground is only 40 knots. And if that gust suddenly ends, you're only traveling 40 knots and you're now stalling close to the ground, which is obviously a very dangerous situation to be in. So that's all we wanted to cover for today. Um, thanks for watching the video and I'll hand it back over to Armand.